Hey, everybody, this is Beyond 1894. It's the official podcast of Louisiana Tech University. Uh, first episode of 2024, first episode of the new year, and it is a special episode. Um, we're here with Dr. Jim Henderson, the 15th university president here at Louisiana Tech. Um, thanks for making time for us. I'm sure you've been told welcome a thousand times, but here's a thousand and one welcome to Louisiana Tech, and thank you for being on the podcast. Well, listen, every one of those welcomes is deeply appreciated, and I'm, I'm honored to be part of the broadcast. I've, I've been uh, This has been part of my listening schedule now for uh, well over a year, and it's uh, it's really well done and, and just proud to be part of it. Well, much appreciated. Um, we sort of talk with all of our guests about their tech journey, um, and for a lot of our guests, that means growing up pretty local and going to Louisiana Tech and sticking around after. And you have a tech journey in a way. Um, and I right. think I mentioned this with um, our recently retired 14th University President, Dr. Geis. He's kind of, I told him he's the most tech person of all time. Yeah, absolutely. Spent five decades, student, professor, you know, administrator, president. And uh, that's hard to follow up. You know, next standing next <laughs> thank, to someone. Thank you for the opportunity. Right, right. I appreciate that. Right. But you have tech ties. That's right. And um, you have connections to this university. And so talk to us about sort of beginnings and sort of how those tech ties started, because I think it sort of planted the seeds for where you are right now. Well, sure. And, and first, let me, you, you mentioned uh, President Geis. And, you know, Les and I have been dear friends for more than 20 years. And someone who gives 50 years of their life to an institution uh, should be venerated, and you know we 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 named him President Emeritus of Louisiana mm -hmm. Tech. Uh, that's the, you know that's one of the steps. We're going to continue to to honor his legacy. Uh, he created such a sound foundation for what's coming next at this institution, and uh, uh, just deeply appreciate him and admire him as as all people associated with the Tech family should. Right. Uh, but my, my journey to Tech started uh, when a guy from Jennings, Louisiana, rode up here with a friend uh, to meet a guy named Joe I. Mm -hmm. And they both tried out for football. Both were offered scholarships. And uh, my father played for two years, went overseas for three, came back after Coach I had held his scholarship and that mm -hmm. of 21 other of his teammates. And they all finished their careers at Louisiana Tech. And so what did he play? He was a, uh, a guard. Okay. Uh, he played next to Leo Sanford when he came back from the war. Okay. Now, if you don't know who Leo Sanford is, Leo played at Fair Park High School and got to Tech in uh, about 1946. He weighed, I think, 205 pounds, which was huge yeah. for an offensive lineman at this, in, in those days. And so my dad would always tell the story that he looked over at him and, and Joe I would pull the center and the guard as lead blockers. And dad looked at him and tapped him on the hip and said, all right, fat man, try to keep up. <laughs> he said all he saw was the back of Leo's jersey running down the field after that. So it shouldn't be surprised Leo went on to become a, 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 a world champion with the Baltimore Colts. He right. snapped to Johnny Unitas, was a, a linebacker as well. Uh, and I'll tell you, I went a little bit in depth on, on Leo because I grew up around – these former Tech football players, mm -hmm. Bobby I.A., um, Mike Reed, Racer Halstead, uh, Tony Salvaggio, Eddie Harrelson. Not just exposed to Tech athletics at a young age, but exposed to like some of the greats the in legends. Tech history. Yeah, You know, Dad's roommate before the war was a guy named Cale Martin from Winsboro, who uh, went on to be with the Chicago Cardinals mm. World Championship football team. Uh, they wanted him to replace Johnny Weismuller as Tarzan. Uh, but just another aspect of, of tech lore that's mm -hmm. kind of hidden somewhere yeah, back yeah. in the back. You know, I got to meet people like Jimmy Mize and 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 these these tech legends that that just created a, a, an aura, a culture around this institution that certainly spanned generations. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you know, one of Dad's uh, favorite athletes of all time. He coached him in in football, basketball, baseball, and track and field in the fifties. Was a guy named A.L. Williams. Who came here? A legendary uh, developer of quarterbacks mm -hmm. came here and was a very successful coach. Champions Plaza, named after. That's exactly right at, at Louisiana Tech, and 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 I spent my summers in the '80s coming down to Louisiana Tech football camp uh, to spend time with with Al Williams and, and this tech culture. So, you know, we grew up around tech and um, uh, and and around uh, so many people that have been associated with tech. Of course, my mother mm -hmm. is also a tech graduate, two-time tech graduate, yeah. '58 and '69 with her master's degree. Uh, she's from Hodge, Louisiana, and when I look out the south-facing window of my yep. new office, I can see the paper mill where her yes. father and her brother spent their careers. Uh, so a lot of deep roots here, but and 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 probably the, the the shallowest root that has the, I think the most potential to grow is my young son. My youngest is a sophomore here. Mm -hmm. He uh, he refused to look at any other school. In fact, he he did quite well on his ACT score. 
and was not receiving any mailings from anybody else. And I said, <laughs> Alex, you got to explain this to him. And he says, well, you, there was a box to check. And he said, I checked the box that said ACT can only send my score to Louisiana Tech. His mind was made up. And I blame uh, my father, <laughs> my mother. I blame AL, uh, 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 Bobby IA, and Leo Sanford. He used to go spend Friday evenings with them in Shreveport mm-hmm. eating dinner every night. And they indoctrinated him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're going to indoctrinate him to a good cause, I guess that's the best kind of yeah. indoctrination. And he's just thriving here. So, I mean, I guess the question you have after hearing that is when it came time for you to go to college, why wasn't tech, you know, your, your first choice? You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a story I don't talk about a lot because it, it took a long time for me to, to kind of, uh, to, to, to refine the path. I mm-hmm. was, you know, academically accomplished. I was a, a, a very good athlete. I was recruited to a number of schools. Uh, was appointed to U.S. Military Academy and U.S. Naval Academy and attended the U.S. Military Academy. But I had, um, in those days, they had not done a lot of studies on head injuries. And I had had a number of, of head injuries playing football, and the style that I played was was pretty haphazard, mm-hmm. pretty, um, uh, 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 a pretty hard type of football. Yeah. And uh, the last one did significant damage uh, at Army. And so I was it ended my Army career very abruptly, very quickly. Uh, woke up in Walter Reed Hospital and spent the next year and a half with a swollen optic nerve trying to relearn how to read, how to deal with headaches, how mm-hmm. to deal with a number of things. And it, it took a path that has been so clearly laid out for me uh, and disrupted it. And uh, now, after time, after you know being married to 30 years to a, a wonderful woman who, who understood why would, that would be a challenge for me, uh, the, the, I realized that that experience was a character building experience. It taught me a little bit about resilience, how to, uh, when the plans go awry, how do you, how do you regroup? How do you refocus? And, uh, it took me a couple of years to, to really figure that out. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, I, I was in Northwest Arkansas where I'd grown up, uh, worked for, uh, a guy named Kimmins Wilson out of Memphis, Tennessee in hotel business. I was going to school when I could. And finally, my father said, look, they had relocated to Natchitoches. My mother was teaching at Northwestern. And she says, he said, why don't you come down here, finish your degree, marry a Cajun girl, and get on with life? Yeah. And I said, Dad, <laughs> I'm not doing any of that. <laughs> and about two months later, I said, hey, uh, if that offer is still on the table, that's what I'm going to do. So that's, that's about, that was my college journey. Yeah. It was certainly atypical. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if that had not happened, probably I would have been playing for A.L. Williams here, here at Louisiana Tech. I mean, things – you sort of alluded to it that things work out the way they're supposed to anyway. That's and, right. um, you know, that, that journey, you know, it kept you in the state and it kept you in the system, you know, now. And, and I think it's, um, you've kept kind of within that circle in your past, you know, stops in your career. Uh, my question now, you know, cause you've talked about sort of your athletic background and at what point did you decide that, staying in higher education was going to be something that you were going to do. Why was that appealing to you? Why did you want to keep your career going, you know, in the collegiate system? Which I had a, a career in business and was, right. and was doing, uh, doing quite well, moving all over the country, uh, you know, working, uh, usually 16 hour days, mm-hmm. uh, but mostly just six days a week. Your degree is in, uh, my degree is in journalism, right? But as I was pursuing my degree in journalism, I was in hotel management at the mm-hmm. same time. And when I, uh, graduated with my degree, I was offered a job, uh, as a newspaper reporter, uh, and my wife looked at the difference in the salaries, and she said, "You know, I'm pregnant. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how we're going to raise a child on, on yeah. eighteen thousand dollars a year." And <laughs> yeah. I said, "Okay, so I'll stay in the hotel business." Uh, but my whole family was in education. Both my parents had advanced degrees. Both my brothers had advanced degrees, and we would get gather for Christmas or whatever. And I'd say, "You know, you people couldn't make it in the real world." <laughs> but then I started noticing something in 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 business. I would notice people that uh, were in uh, low-paying positions uh, that seemed incredibly bright, that seemed that they had that 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 je ne sais quoi, that, mm-hmm. that ability to do so much more, and yet they were in jobs that were barely paying subsistence wages. And I would scratch my head, and I'd say, you know, I remember one uh, person in a caller, Marilyn. I said, Marilyn, why, why are you why are you doing this? You could do anything you wanted to do. And she looked at me and she goes, you know, no one's ever told me that. Mm. I started thinking about how, you know, I grew up around education. I grew up with educated parents and family. I was, you know, my fourth or fifth generation 
uh, college student. And how many people have never been exposed to the power of education to transform lives, to put you in control of your own economic and uh, mobility, your social mobility, if you will. And so as, as our family started to grow and, and moving became much more of, an, of a, an, uh, a problem for us, mm-hmm. uh, my wife said, I, I was offered actually a job in Jacksonville, Florida. And I remember my wife said, well, how far a drive is that from Gaydon? And if you've ever driven from Gaydon, Louisiana to Jacksonville, Florida, you know it's about a year and a half to sure. get from one to the other. And, uh, and so uh, kind of a conspiracy of circumstances, we had a reform-minded secretary of labor that had been appointed under the Foster administration. A friend of a friend put us in connection with each other. He said, look, I need someone to help me revamp the way we do workforce development, the way we administer uh, uh, this office. And so the next thing I was involved in workforce development. Did that for, for five years, uh, including running the, the, the largest incumbent worker training program that exists in the state and exists in the, in the country. Uh, and, and one morning, uh, the new Secretary of Labor, John Warner Smith, came into my office early. And I, and I still got to the office in my private sector schedule at 6 o'clock. And at, at that agency, that was mm-hmm. about two hours before the next person would arrive. Mm-hmm. And uh, John came in early one morning and he said, uh, he goes, I think I gave you to Walter Bumpus last night. I said, you know, I said, I'll do whatever you want me to do, but uh-huh. you're going to have to explain what that means. Yeah. He says, well, that's the, uh, the president of the new Louisiana Community and Technical College system. So two weeks later, I'm the executive. It's like he got traded. It's yeah, like I got traded. Got you know, traded. And, 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 and look, if, 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 when they hand that ball to you, I, didn't yeah. get, I did not get the 10-year, $700 million job <laughs> sure. that the Dodgers the were offering at the time. Signing bonus, and but, yeah, yeah. But this was the next best opportunity. <laughs> and uh, so uh, – Two weeks later, I'm working Department of uh, Louisiana Community and Technical College System uh, under uh, a, a visionary, Walter Bumpus, who's now the, the president of the American Association of Community Colleges. And he said he wanted someone to bring a new business-focused uh, perspective to that entity. And, and, you know, the years that I spent uh, in that system, uh, five years in, in, in Baton Rouge and then another uh, six in, in Bossier, uh, really opened my eyes to the process aspects of, of academia, of course, right? That's, that's part of it as we built that. But also how sometimes we allow structures to be impediments to the mission. Certainly we do that in higher education. Yeah. And I think that I brought uh, uh, enough of a lack of understanding and a lack of experience to not be shackled to that. An outsider's perspective in that's a way, right. yeah. I remember going to the first facility that I saw. There's a technical training facility that was so deplorable. They had rolls of visqueen in every office. And at the end of it, the, the director or the dean said, what did you think of the tour? And I said, I've got a question. What's, what's with all the visqueen? And she said, you know, when it starts to rain, they go into intercom and say code blue, and everyone rolls, runs to their roll of visqueen and covers their assigned wow. computer equipment and furniture in this country. And I left with a kind of an empty pit in my stomach. And that was one of 42 campuses of this type. And I said, you know, the traditional process to, uh, uh, to fix these kinds of issues, to, to do with deferred maintenance, can't possibly comprehend what this, what this could be. It won't, it won't work. So we led the, uh, the advance of what became Act 391, which was a quarter of a billion dollar investment in those facilities. Four years later, no one thought we would get it through. Mm. And we did. Mm. So four years later, everyone lined up to battle what became Act 360 and didn't understand the politics of it, that that we'd already gotten the votes for Act 360 four years prior when we got them for 391. So it was a total of about $600 million in new technical training facilities that came around just in time to lead the recovery from Hurricanes Katrina and Rita. We put 16,000 Louisianans in through a, a certified training program for the construction industry. Uh, we did a lot of, of pretty transformational things and, and grew that system, uh, reformed it, made it very cost effective, made it uh, very oriented to the market, uh, uh, had some inspiring growth stories that are all undergirded by individual stories of people that are realizing their best potential. And, and so that's where that's where I became uh, enamored, really, of the power of education. Uh, uh, was asked to come to my alma mater, Northwestern State was there for two years. After the first year, the, the UL system president mm-hmm. resigned. And immediately they asked if I would come and, and be interested in that. And I said, absolutely not. 
I'm here with students. I'm here with faculty. This is the greatest experience I've ever had as a professional. I'm not coming. And then after about eight months, uh, another uh, uh, legislative session where we just had gotten pummeled in terms of investments in higher education, uh, I got a call from a guy named Sean Murphy, who is uh, in Jackson Parish, just south of here. And he says, he goes, any chance we can get you to, to come down here? And so I, I visited with the board leadership and said, okay, I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, seven years ago. Uh, and it was a great experience. We, uh, we, we righted the ship. We got people thinking in a systemic way. We, uh, we freed institutions to focus on their individual missions to be the best iteration of themselves, but then we leveraged that towards some collective outcomes. Mm-hmm. Uh, this year, you know, and I saw some headlines that compared uh, the investments in our facilities uh, compared to some other systems in, in higher education in Louisiana. Yeah. I, I felt quite proud of that. Absolutely. Not that it's a competition. It's, uh, it's for the greater good. It's good to do good, though. Yeah, but it's do, good to do good. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we, we really did some things that I think righted the ship. There's still some real challenges. But for me, the personal challenge was this, uh, this, this disconnect, this, this layer of separation that kept me from working directly with students and faculty. And that's what my passion is. Uh, we spent a lot of time on the nine member institution campuses mm-hmm. of the UL system, but that's not the same as it being your students and your faculty. Though they all worked for me ultimately, though my signature was on all the diplomas, yep. it's just a degree of separation yeah. that to me was untenable. And so when President Guys told me that he was uh, considering retirement, I said, well, listen, uh, President Guys, you leave when it's your schedule. Uh, and after about a year, he, he, he would, we would have multiple conversations and finally he says, it's, it's time. He goes, I want to get this class in. I want to bring some projects to fruition and then I'm going to, I'm going to go home. And I said, okay. And, and, and as I started talking about it with my wife, she says, well, would you ever be interested in going to Louisiana tech? And I said, of all the institutions in our system of all of them in Louisiana, really there's no other institution that would pique my interest like Louisiana Tech. You think about the history since 1894, Mm -hmm. how this institution has been on the cutting edge and developing programming, certainly in technical fields Mm -hmm. and the sciences. But it's been so much more than that. It's been innovative when it comes to economic development, when it comes to entrepreneurship, when it comes to uh, market-oriented research, applied research, research that actually benefits people in their everyday lives. so that history was so compelling. Of course, you know, Dan Renault's a dear friend, uh, Les Geist, dear friend, they both have laid such a strong foundation. But for me, it was the potential. Mm-hmm. This institution is poised for growth in terms of enrollment, in terms of quality of scholarship. It's the best undergraduate experience, I believe, in the state of Louisiana, bar none. Mm. Immense potential for growth and research productivity and certainly continued growth in those public-private partnerships that really separate this institution from every other. Being a part of that, working with the faculty, the staff, the students, and the leadership to advance this institution on behalf of those students and the alumni and the communities we serve uh, was just the most um, uh, compelling prospect for me, and it's one I had to say yes to. Yeah, I imagine it wasn't a decision that you made lightly, though. I know that, uh, you know, being the president of the UL system, you mentioned, you know, kind of being integrated into each of those nine campuses in a way, but being, like you said, a degree kind of removed from a direct campus involvement, but you kind of were part of the family of each of those campuses. Um, So to step down from that and focus your attention now here at Louisiana Tech, I have to imagine that that came with some caveats and some hard choices. So I know that tech was appealing. You've made that clear. But what went into that decision and ultimately encourage you to, to, to take this up? Well, it really was, you know, a, a very thoughtful approach to that. Of course, certainly with, with my wife, Tanya, uh, we do everything in lockstep together. And uh, if, if, if you can marry a Cajun girl and stay with her for 30 years, <laughs> I recommend it because they, that's certainly a character building experience. <laughs> and uh, she has been my partner through, through all of this. We had a great conversation about it. And, and I did have to reflect on some of the work we had done systemically. One, one of those is, is the development of a management and leadership institute mm-hmm. where I have uh, 22 people from all of our institutions go through a nine-month rigorous professional development program. Uh, faculty and, and staff, say mid-level folks that are looking to move up, 
Uh, and historically, what we have done is someone who masters their craft, we put them in a leadership position. And though they have spent years studying and researching in their discipline, we give them none of the tools and competencies necessary to be effective leaders. And so we developed a, uh, a, a, what I think is a world-class program in developing them into leaders. Uh, they're on their eighth cohort now of this leadership program. And I've gotten to, to know each of those individuals very deeply. Several of them are here at, at Louisiana Tech. I, I think Jeremy Meir is in it this mm-hmm. year. Jamie Newman is in it yeah. uh, this year. Uh, and and to, uh, to get to know these individuals at th- that level. Uh, I did develop the curriculum myself. The, the reading list is mine. It comes with uh, some of the standards in, in leadership, you know, the four frames, organizational mm-hmm. frames, reframing organizations. Uh, good to great, those kinds of things, but also throw in some uh, some wild cards. One year we made, I made him read Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Okay, uh, that one wasn't as well accepted. <laughs> I, I, they thought it was a stretch. I thought there was an immediate leadership application. <laughs> they didn't of, see the vision. The, they weren't no. learning the lessons that you learned. Uh, this year they're reading Team of Rivals, which is uh, the Doris Kearns Goodwin um, uh, Lincoln biography. That is it's exceptional, but it is weighty, mm-hmm. and uh, and they'll have to. They'll have to figure out how to get through that while they're doing their full-time jobs. Right. right? It's, uh, it's, it's a pretty rigorous program. But that one, you can look at the Reginald F. Lewis program we've got that's really making a difference for these African-American males mm-hmm. that shows them how they can be the best version of themselves, and it's all in their hands. Right. Patterned after uh, Reginald F. Lewis, who was a self-made billionaire, uh, just a great role model for, for folks to follow and, and taking control of your own destiny. The Compete Louisiana program that, that uh, opened the doors for the 650,000 Louisianans that have some college credits but no degree. Mm-hmm. And finding ways to eliminate the barriers that keep them from coming back to school. And then all of the, the folks that work at the system office. It's a relatively small team, and so you d- develop close relationships with with that team. And uh, and, and, and leaving them was, was all part of the consideration. But after seven years, I said, okay, these are the things that we've done. They're positioned to grow. It's time for them to get some new perspective. And it's time for me to go where I think I can be most effective. Mm. And that's at a university like Louisiana Tech, where we can develop this institution to its 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 uh, august potential. Yeah. And so we're glad to be here. Yeah, Dr. Geis, it's, you kind of mirror what he mentioned about his decision to retire from here and that he wanted to make sure that Tech was in a place, he could leave it in a good place where he was confident that the next person, you, could take it and run with it. And, you know, he didn't want to step down too early with a lot of unfinished business. So I imagine leaving the system office was similar in that way, that you, you know, you wanted to leave it in a good spot. Um, And, and, you know, and and Rick Gallo, who was was at at Grambling, Rick came into Grambling right as I came into the system office. Uh, He and I have worked together for almost 25 years in different different, uh, applications. Uh, He's going to do just a, a fabulous job. I have no doubt about that. I think he's the perfect person at the perfect time. For, for, for that role. Uh, President Geis, you know, over these last seven years, he and I have engaged in conversations almost on a weekly basis, yeah. you know, in-depth about tech, but about higher education, about some of the things we're doing. Uh, we have a deep affinity for you know, respect for each other. Uh, and so it was just a natural, I think, smooth transition uh, that, that's going to, 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 to reap some significant benefits for the students and the, and the alumni of this institution. Right. And I, it's... It's good, too, in the sense that you're kind of coming with built-in connections to the system office, the other presidents of the system. You already have a relationship with a lot of legislators in the state, um, a lot of things that are beneficial, I would imagine, in this role. Um, you're kind of coming with all those relationships already. So, you know, I know this is, we're literally in your first week. So, <laughs> while I know that your intent is to hit the ground running, um, I'm sure there are a lot of things on your plate and you kind of have a vision for your first, are you sort of, how are you setting your goals here? The first six weeks, first six months, what are you kind of doing here at the beginning? So my graduate study is in organizational behavior and, and, and really a focus on uh, teams and culture, organizational culture. And so you can come into an organization that's as complex and it's as, as, as broad as Louisiana Tech is, and you can make some very quick decisions um, that seem like low hanging fruit, mm. but they don't affect the culture, right? And so there are elements of the culture here that are just perfect and you're well aligned with what the institution needs to be. But like any organization, there's other aspects of the culture that need to be brought along. And there's a process to do that. It involves deep conversations with 
the campus community, internal and external, mm-hmm. uh, in, a, in a variety of forums. Uh, it's some individual conversations. It's group conversations. It's, it's impromptu conversations. Uh, it's developing those relationships where people realize, okay, this person sitting in the president's office is an authentic leader mm-hmm. who is truly interested in what's in the best interest of this institution. Now, so over the last seven years, I've onboarded seven university presidents yeah. and helped them walk through those first periods. One of the bits of advice that I always give them is that when you enter the president's office, you're going to be lauded with respect and all the accoutrements of the office. Uh, the office deserves that. You don't. Mm. You can never confuse the occupant of the office of the presidency with the office of the presidency. Mm. If you ever do that, you're making a very fatal mistake. You have to, as the occupant, strive every day to live up to being worthy to be that, that occupant. Because, listen, th- th- this, I'm the 15th president mm-hmm. at Louisiana Tech. There will be a 16th president. Right. Right. And, and hopefully that 16th president will be better than I. And we'll build on the things that I put in place just as I will build on the things that have been put in place by, by, by Les and Dan. But we're temporary occupants, right? The, that office will remain in perpetuity. It's the legacy of the institution, which the institution is really defined by its faculty. It's really defined by its students, by its alumni. And Tech has the most loyal alumni base, I think, of, of, of any institutions in, in our system. Yeah. Uh, and rightly so. Uh, those are the, 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 the long-standing aspects of the institution. And so you have to realize that you're a temporary occupant of a very important office and treat that with, with great respect, hold it very dear, and ensure that you leave it better than you found it. Yeah. Um, you bring up an interesting point about wanting to make sure that you're tenure here is part of a continued legacy. Um, and I think you talk about legacy and you talk about alumni passion, and even faculty, student body, but the passion here for the university. Um, I'm interested what, you know, if there's someone listening and watching right now that, you know, knows that you are a new president, but that's where the, their knowledge base stops. And even after hearing you talk, I hope they're sort of, you know, comforted by your, your presence at the university now. But if you were to speak to someone like that directly and let them know that, you know, you're you're the champion for them at this time, and in this role, you're going to be doing what's best for Louisiana Tech. You know, what would you say to that person who kind of has those concerns? Well, I would say that that, that Louisiana Tech has so many strengths, so many um, laudable aspects of the institution that 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 are well known, but there are so many hidden aspects of the institution that are not. We're going to elevate those. We're going to reveal those. I think in in in, in a strong way. I, one of the the uh, uh, the traits that has carried me well is communication. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to communicate. We're going to tell the tech story wide and far. Um, we're going to tell it to every kid in Ruston, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're going to take it on the road. We're going to draw a circle, and it's it's an ever enlarging circle. By the yeah. way, when I describe it, <laughs> and we're going to own it. We're going to be the institution of choice within that that geographical circle. Um, because that's what this institution deserves. This is a, um, I talked about the rich history of this institution and, and what it's done and how it's been on the cutting edge of some of the, the advances that have, one, protected our nation, that have advanced our economy, that have driven quality of life in this region. Uh, uh, we, want, we, want to do this, do those, we want to do those at scale, mm-hmm. a larger scale than we ever have before. I, um, uh, uh, our fear our danger is is not doing well it's not fulfilling our potential and when you measure yourself not against where you've been and what you've done in the past but against what's possible that's where you develop the audacious goals that are truly worthy because you don't want to get complacent right you can't get complacent and and that's one of the things that 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 um you know, we, in, in management theory, we talk a lot about smart goals that are sp- mm-hmm. specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. But what that really becomes, they're short sighted, they're manipulable, they're anemic, they're reactionary, and they're time oblivious. And I use that as a lecture sometimes <laughs> when I'm talking to folks, that I, and this really makes my, my colleagues in, in, in the College of Business, College of Management sometimes cringe that the greatest impediment to organizational success are, is the strategic plan and smart goals. Yeah. <laughs> because what we've done is we've created these little cards. You can check the boxes, right? Yeah. But you're not actually doing the meaningful work to say, okay, 
where is it we would be if we didn't have to be concerned about resources, if we weren't concerned about the administrivia that, that often con- confines our thinking, if we just if eliminated all of that and said, okay, what would this institution look like at its optimum level? Yeah. And we start working towards that, knowing that there's going to be those administrative barriers, there's going to be the, the, the scarcity of resources that can be impediments. But if, if the vision is truly worthwhile, you find ways to work around that. It's a much more energizing way to approach things than one of retrenchment. And I saw so many institutions that went through the eight-year period in Louisiana when we disinvested in higher education that had been so focused on survival and retrenchment, they had forgotten about the mission and about the importance of growth and how if this mission is really worthwhile for the students you serve, it's got to be worthwhile for even more. And so be doing aggressive. things that's good. Be yeah. Aggressive, yeah. You got to be aggressive, and and you be aggressive, or you just die a slow death. Mm. And that's just that's 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 not an option. Yeah. Certainly not for Louisiana Tech, not for any of our institutions. This institution is one that's poised for I think the most significant growth. And I think you meant, you kind of alluded to it. I think when you're strategic planning, you have to be careful not to come up with ideas for the sake of coming up with ideas. Say yeah. we need X number of goals. Let's just hammer these out, and then we have them here when we need them. It, it has to have some you know, purpose behind it. And look, I got, I got into a great conversation with Marcia Dickerson, who mm-hmm. is one of the experts in strategic planning and, and evaluation on this campus, one of the many faculty that are expert on that. And, of course, we laugh about it as colleagues and, and joke about it, but she, but she understood that you know, sometimes when you're just checking boxes, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, that's when you develop these these anemic things, and you just develop goals that are there because you know you can achieve them. Mm-hmm. I went to uh, the the campus of Google in two thousand and six when I was frustrated because I had I had an email system that couldn't be workable for more than any two week stretch of time, yeah. and I said, "I bet these guys can do it." So we, a friend of mine named Jimmy Sautel and I, flew to San Jose, California. We met with the Google folks. We were the first to move an institutional wide email system to gmail hmm. we were sitting in a room with one of their technicians or one of their 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 liaisons and she brought in a technician and i explained to him what i was looking to do he goes yeah we could we can do that and i said well how long would it take you and he goes well give me to this afternoon and i thought about the time yeah i thought about the the, the depth of that work how important that work was we walked around that campus and we saw you know sixteen thousand employees at the time uh, they had uh, sand volleyball courts, they had ping pong tables, they had all this kind of stuff. They had a guy playing a guitar. And I said, this guy playing the guitar, are you worried that you're not going to get eight hours of work out of him? Because that's what we would worry about in state government. And I said, we're more worried we're going to get 16 out of him and he won't go home. I thought, what a different mindset. Yeah. But I did get to talk to some of their leadership and they said, you know, our approach is kind of still like a startup. That we set goals that we know are unachievable right now with our current thinking and with our current resources. And they're six month goals. So, if this is where we're going to be in six months, what are the things we would have to change to be there today, to start doing it today? And it doesn't mean you're haphazard, it doesn't mean you're not thinking long term because you have to do that. And the long term vision and mission of this institution is sacrosanct, it's going to remain. But then, how do you make giant leaps toward that in a, in a, in a constrained period of time. Uh, uh, that's the conversation that we're going to be having across this campus with multiple constituent groups. And it's, it's a whole lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, getting, also getting everybody on board is a task within itself, but, um, you know, leadership and administration can make a difference there too. I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. We're going to talk about the phrase tech family. Um, it's a, I mean, it has double use. We use it, you know, kind of as a, as a feel-good marketing term in a way. But it does mean you can talk to most anyone who set foot on this campus and who has had, you know, extended period of time here. It means something to them. Uh, students, faculty, staff, alumni, all levels, tech family has meaning to them. Um, and for, you know, like we talked to Dr. Geis, it had quite literal meaning in the sense that his whole family, you know, bleeds tech blue. Uh, and you have some direct familial ties, too. But what does tech family mean to you, and do you think that that meaning may evolve as you're here? So, so though I've been familiar with the tech family and been, you know, the, the, on the periphery of the tech family for, for many, many years, uh, these last couple of months, Tanya and I have been on campus multiple times having conversations, and that's when we were embraced mm. by the tech family, and it was a completely different feeling, if you will, and it was one that that... that 
I, I somewhat expected, but I was ill prepared for that. They really, it was, it was, it was just like uh, when when you see family at a family reunion you haven't seen in a long time, and they and they embrace you, and you know, a long time. Haven't missed the whatever. beat, yeah. Haven't missed me. And uh, and so there truly is a notion of family that that permeates this this institution. You have to be careful with those words so that they don't become meaningless, right? Mm-hmm. And and they can because we'll overuse them. Uh, you know, sometimes when you get an email that says "Dear Team," and you think, "Oh, yeah. all right, really? Are we really a team, or yeah. is it just for the sake of this email?" Well, that hadn't really been the case here. I think there truly is a sense of family, where people are invested in each other, they care about each other at the individual level, at the personal level, mm-hmm. as much as the professional level. They work collaboratively towards different ends. I have uh, noticed in conversations with uh, individuals that. I'll meet someone else that I didn't think had any connection whatsoever, and they'll reiterate the, the conversation. They'll revisit the same yeah. conversation because that's the closeness of the friendship, right? That's uh, There is a, a, a communal, familial relationship amongst individuals at this institution that, that is, is a hallmark. Uh, that's a strength, right? That enables you to, to as a family, move forward. Uh, towards those audacious goals, but it also means that you can be resilient when things do go awry. And I remember being on this campus uh, the day after the tornadoes in mm-hmm. uh, 2019. Uh, one, I wanted to, to put my eyes on President Guys. He had called me in, in the early morning hours, and I said, I'll be there, you know, first thing. And, uh, and you know, I watched, I looked in the, in the eyes of, of people whose homes had been destroyed talked to faculty who were uh, uh, had been displaced uh, but then I saw people students and faculty cleaning up I saw a legendary alum of this institution Carl Malone on a tractor off hmm. in the hinterlands picking up debris I don't think anyone had asked him he right. didn't want anyone to know there was no cameras around he just was out there doing it uh, that's what family does and in one of those moments those moments of despair those moments of catastrophe is when you really truly understand the value of family, and that's 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 where I finally fully understood the meaning here at Tech. Wow, uh, yeah, and I think too, you sort of uh, made a good point about how saying that you're a part of the Tech family doesn't necessarily mean oh I'm I'm I love my employer and I'm loyal to my employer. It it means that you are connected to the people you work with and the institution that you work at, and there are ways to do that you know without feeling like some sort of corporate entity that you know it's it's not about that right that's right um it's just just, it's just taking taking a a true interest in the well-being of those around you right and i think that that spills over to students too when they come in they feel like they're part of a family and you know last uh seven years we've been living in baton rouge we talked to a number of families that has sent their uh their high school graduates Mm -hmm. here or that have deep connections to Louisiana Tech, and it even comes across in that conversation there that said it just felt different. And yeah. they, may, they may not use the word family, uh, but you know that's what they're talking about. Yeah, the word family, the word home. Yeah, that's it right. feels like, it felt you like know, home. We get that a lot. Um, and I think that that's, it boils down to sort of the size of Russ and the size of the campus. But I think growth, you know, we're going to go back to growth here, it kind of scares some people in a way, because uh, especially you talk to some alumni who haven't set foot on campus in 20 years, and they get here and they don't recognize it. And some of them take that in a good way. And some of them say, okay, oh, I kind of miss the institution that I grew up at and that I've been around and that I remember. Um, so what do you say about kind of the, as tech changes and still tries to maintain its core identity, but we're also literally growing into downtown Ruston and expanding the campus and we're growing programs and you mentioned growth plenty of times and how you kind of have that as part of your vision so what do you say about sort of how that's going to keep the core identity of campus in louisiana tech but we're still going to be able to sort of shift into the future yeah so you, you can't cease being who you are right? right and when you know who you are when you have a, a true core set of values and certainly those have been uh, delineated here at tech and in, in the tenets of mm-hmm. tech uh, Can you name them all? I, you know, I wish there were fewer than twelve. <laughs> I know, I'm just uh, put you on we, the spot. We got to figure out how to put those on a on a, on a note card that someone yeah, can carry with handy. them. You could have said twelve words just that sounded good, and I probably would have caught a couple of them. But you could have convinced me that you said all twelve just I, for the record. Very, so very, you know, you're not alone. Yeah, but you, you have to be you have to you have to be authentic, and that's, yeah. that would be inauthentic. <laughs> that, that's a th- but those t- twelve tenets, and I'm, I'm glad we have the Latin translation because that really speaks to the to the new generation coming out. It, yes. it makes it, 
But, but I, I say that in a jest, but I also say that with some uh, with 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 a dose of reality. Yeah. Yes, because that that does harken back to the origins of the academy, right? And tech, first and foremost, is a university focused on learning, focused on plowing. Um, new trails into knowledge, into developing our understanding of the human condition and improving that human condition. Uh, that's the key. And so when we talk about growth, it's not growth for growth's sake. Right. It's growth because we believe so much in the mission that we want to expand its its reach to a broader audience, right? We want to develop the resources that allow us to do it at much larger scale. And so it's growth, but without losing sight of who we are and what we value. And when you can achieve that, it's a little bit delicate, but when you can achieve that, that's when you're reaching the optimum status of a university. And, and again, I just am so bullish on the future of this institution because I think it's the best prepared to realize that future. Is that sort of, I mean, I guess you wouldn't be here if it was, intimidating in a way to, you know, you see the potential and you know that it's your job here to help realize it now. And is that daunting or is that exciting? I mean, it could be both, I guess. You know, it's, 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 I, 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 mostly it's exciting. Yeah. It's, it's not daunting. Again, the things that keep me up awake at night sometimes when I go home is that I do everything that I could have done today to affect change, to, to advance the mission. And, and you're reminded of that sometimes when, when someone will come up to you and say something that you said to them or something that you did for them that to you was just, you know, who, it, it was just an afterthought. Yeah that transformed some aspect of their day of their week or of their journey through, through, through college. And, uh, and I see that a lot at commencement ceremonies when someone will come up and you hand them a diploma mm-hmm. and they'll say, you remember when you did X for me, that saved my college. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I remember that. I remember <laughs> that. But the thing is, those are these little moments of truth that occur so often in life that, that, that take just a minimal amount of effort, they can have a tremendous impact. And I think, okay, was there anything that I missed today that could have had that impact? So those are things that don't really keep me awake. I sleep right. pretty well for four or five hours every night. <laughs> uh, but for, uh, for, for this institution, it's really thinking about, okay, did we advance it towards its potential today as much as we possibly could have? And if not, then what are we gonna do tomorrow to mm-hmm. make up the gap, right? And, and, and that's an exciting place to be. It is, uh, it's exhilarating in, in many ways. I don't find it daunting because I think you've got a close-knit group here that is so focused on the same things. It's just empowering them to help you realize that vision. You know, th- th- we talked a little bit earlier about the office of the presidency and the occupant. Mm-hmm. But their ability to advance an institution is widely wildly overstated quite often it takes everyone it takes everyone it takes every faculty member every staff member i get to get to work early and I've talked to some of the the the, the, the people that are working in, in landscaping mm-hmm. you know their role as they cleaned up the leaves in the quad just the other day uh it just all of a sudden the, the impact that had on the visual aesthetic of campus yeah Somebody came walking through campus and saw the impact of their work and made a decision to come to tech because of that. Yeah. They're absolutely essential to the future of this institution. Yeah. Um, it's And a lot of that, too, goes with, I mean, you're on day five here at the time yeah. of recording. Um, but you've made a point to be visible and be open. And you mentioned earlier that communication is important to you. And I think... Um, Dr. Geis was big on that as well. He wanted to be on campus. He wanted to be face-to-face with faculty and staff. He wanted to be face-to-face with students and make those connections. Because like you said, you don't know in the moment that you might be potentially solidifying someone's decision to come here or to finish here or to change majors to something that they're really passionate about, being on on the fence about it, um, and being visible and being integrated into the campus goes a long way. And I assume that that's part of your long-term mission here is to, to be visible. You know, Les and I uh, differ so much in, in style and in, in backgrounds, uh, but we share that. And mm. it's, it's, it's that, that notion of being present, mm. but authentically present. Uh, it's something that's always, uh, I think it's been one of those places where he and I have synced well uh, as friends and as colleagues is because we both believe in that at, at our core. Uh, I get so much 
intrinsic value from being around the students and developing those relationships. And just yesterday, I, I, in the office for a second, I, I paced when I'm on my cell phone. As mm-hmm. I, you know, I looked out the window, I saw a group of people walking across the campus. So, of course, I had to insert myself in it. And I go downstairs, and, and, and the group comes in. And it's, it's a little bit awkward because you know that they're, they're doing something and they're on a mission. You don't want to stop them from that yeah. mission, but you're like, hey, Hi, can I say something to you or whatever? And one of the students came up to me. And she goes, she goes, you're Dr. Henderson, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she goes, well, you're my Uncle Jim. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> so she happens to be the daughter okay. of my wife's first cousin. So I guess I'm kind of Uncle Jim. Yeah. Uh, but I had no idea she was at Tech. Uh, but she had three friends with her. I got to meet those friends, understand where they were from, all over the state. Uh, two of them from those 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 communities of Monroe and West Monroe, yep. right? So both sides of the Washita River. Uh, but we had great conversations. And so now when I see those students on campus, it's like, hey, I remember mm-hmm. this interaction we had and, and, and you start to develop those relationships. That seems like a very innocuous thing, a, a, a meaningless thing, but that, that one interaction just recharged my entire day. It's like having that shot of espresso at nine yeah. o'clock when everyone else wants to go to the movie. Sure. You know, it's as... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it was one of those moments. And so it, 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 as a university president, you're blessed with having an inordinate number of those moments to develop energy. That's a good point. I I got one more question for you, yeah. and I think it, it kind of ties into what you've been saying. Um, we've talked a lot about potential here and growth and sort of why tech was appealing to you, and it's because of those reasons. And um, I know that an emphasis on recruitment ties into growth and I know that you'll probably have plenty of chances walking out on campus passing tour groups and passing prospective students and you'll have chances to communicate directly with prospective students as they consider tech so my question to you now is what is kind of your elevator pitch maybe a little bit longer than an elevator pitch to a prospective student right now what is good about Louisiana Tech right now why should you come to Louisiana Tech right now so you start with, with the experience while you're at Louisiana Tech. You're going to have a world-class collegiate experience with students that are like you, that are focused on scholarship, that are focused on uh, their ultimate success at an institution that's uh, based on faculty that care about your success. And the number of stories that you hear from students talking about a faculty member that took an interest in them. Well, you heard about it in President Geis's mm-hmm. Uh, 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 podcast interview where he was talking about the faculty member that made a difference. Well, those stories, again, span generations. And it's still the culture of this institution. The faculty are going to develop a relationship with you as a student, embrace you as a student because they're invested in your success. And then when you graduate Louisiana Tech, just look at the numbers. You have the highest median salary. You have some of the highest entry salaries. And so if, if it's if it's uh, the economic self-sufficiencies you're looking for, this is the pathway to that. You look at the work that's being done by tech graduates in, in the environment, in architecture, in the arts, mm-hmm. in education. Uh, they're contributing in every sector of the economy. And so it truly is the pathway to you realizing whatever future you want to realize. There's no institution, I think, in the state of Louisiana that is more focused on preparing the student for life and career success at Louisiana Tech. And when you graduate from Louisiana Tech, you control your destiny. Bravo. I'm, I'm going to go back in time and re-enroll in tech and be a student here again. I might as well. We'll do it together. <laughs> yeah. um, well, Dr. Henderson, I know you're here in your first full week and in a busy week, I'm I'm certain, and that it's going to stay busy for a long time, but that's a good thing, and I know that you're, you're happy about that. So I appreciate you making time for us, and I speak for the – tech family on behalf of the tech family when I say we're glad you're here and I know everyone you know it ties back to being passionate about the institution and sort of the office being its own entity and that someone's just in a role in that office tech family members it doesn't matter who's in the president's office they want that person to do well because they care about Louisiana Tech so you caring about Louisiana Tech is going to go a long way so thank you for being part of the tech family thank you for being here today and We'll see you around. Listen, it is such an honor to be here as president. It's an honor to be here as your guest on your podcast. Uh, This is a very special institution, as you know well. And uh, I'm just looking forward to some many successes for many years to come. So go dogs. Go dogs.